Hey, I am Alex Rin, and I am here to do my analysis and review of Lecture 4 of the Inductive Summary of Physics course by Professor James Elias. So let's jump into the, uh, the, uh, the, the different in, um, integrations that he's going to go through. The first one is the acceleration of circular motion. Um, the, this, as, as I understand it, the basic summary of this one goes, um, that, uh, from observation, we can kind of tell that these planetary orbits don't seem to follow Galileo's law of motion. Namely, they, they go in a circle. They don't, they don't follow what we now understand to be the law of inertia because they, they, they don't proceed in a straight line. They go in something that resembles a circle or apparently a circular uh, orbit. Even once we have the the heliocentric model, it, they they do seem to be traveling all around the sun. Um, so the question then is, what kind of acceleration would be needed to cause this kind of circular motion? We now know it's elliptical, but it was apparently circular at the time, um, or near enough. I believe Kepler had had proven that it was was actually elliptical. Um, so the, the, the basic investigation portion of this is to do a somewhat standard geometric derivation of the acceleration of circular motion. This is a derivation I used to do in my physics classes as well. Uh, basically what it involves, it involves setting up, uh, two vector, two triangles that, that relate, uh, different vectors together. And the, those triangles happen to be similar. So one vector of triangles involves uh, two radius vectors at two different positions, and then the uh, the delta r vector, and then two velocity vectors at those same two positions, and the delta v vector. Uh, when you find the delta v vector, you can ultimately solve for the acceleration because acceleration is just that delta v vector divided by the delta t. Um, so when you do that, when you go through this analysis, definitely take a look at the lecture if you want to see the analysis in more detail. But when you go through that, you end up with the scalar definition of acceleration as being equivalent to v squared over r. Um, so uh, I I do when I when thinking about this, I do I and I thought this was also really important to do. Uh, you have to make that small angle approximation for the the delta s. Otherwise, as uh, Professor Elias points out, um, the, the 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 shape you have of the the planet mo planetary motion isn't actually triangle; it's a sector. But when you make the small angle approximation, they they get closer and closer to being triangles. So making that small approx angle approximation for delta s turns that that sector into a triangle um the question i have about this um is uh the one one thing i always like to point out in this derivation is the vector nature of acceleration and and in particular when you when you draw that vector um and again you're, you you have to do the small angle approximation to get this exactly right but you can definitely see that the vector is uh, is pointed towards the center as well. So it's uh, it it it's one of those things that that again when you when you realize that the vector is aimed at the center, it's one of those things that is really helpful in coming to the conclusion we're eventually going to come to that it's actually gravity that's causing this. So uh, curious if that. Uh, if that addition needs to be in there or, uh, or maybe not. Um, then, um, the, this, this was somewhat made, but I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of curious how the distinction between speed and velocity comes in in this derivation. Um, really the centripetal acceleration, even though he's the symbol V, it's referring to the speed. Like that's not a vector equation right there. That is a that is a scalar equation that gives you the magnitude of centripetal acceleration. Um, the the geometric derivation certainly uses the uh, the vector character of the two velocities, and uh, to 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 find the uh, the 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 magnitude of that that delta v vector. So. 
Um, definitely seems like there's some vector aspect to it, but the equation itself um, uh, does does not really involve the vector. So the question then is, you know, to in in what way are the vectors involved there? Um, how do you get the vector? How, in what way do the do the velocity vectors give rise to the acceleration vector? That sort of thing. Um, so the next one we talked about was the inverse square law. And this one basically uh, looks like this. Uh, Newton was familiar with Kepler's laws and he had the centrip he now had the centripetal acceleration formula. So the question then is given that, whoops, uh, what is the acceleration that the heavenly bodies exert on their satellites, namely the planets, or if we're talking about uh, the orbit of a moon around a planet, then the satellite would be the moon. Um, so basically what this is, this is the algebraic uh, derivation of the inverse square law. And, and basically what that does, that involves setting the centripetal acceleration of a planet equal to the, um, uh, uh, and, and combining that, not equal to it, but combining that with the fact that the velocity is equal to uh, 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle, divided by the period of the satellite. Um, so because it's a constant speed, that would not be, that would actually be a speed, not a velocity, I misspoke. But because it's a constant speed uh, around that time, you can make that approximation. Um, the conclusion we ultimately come to is that the orbital acceleration is equal to 4 pi squared over k r squared. And in this case, k is just... Um, it's, I believe, uh, I believe Professor Elliot either refers to it as Galileo's constant or Kepler's constant. I'm not remembering off the top of my head. In any event, it's important to know that that is different for each heavenly body. That K is not a universal constant. It's different for each orbit. Um, in particular, each, each heavenly body that the thing is orbiting around. So, important to know. Um, so, uh, one thing I, I, I found particularly memorable, um, uh, at one point Professor Elias has this, this sentence that the heavens were viewed as a sort of magical place. Um, and it's, there's, there's a sense in which I get why that's the, uh, why, why he uses that type of language. Um, but what, what I, what what I think uh, I think it would be more accurate to say they they were viewed as having their own special set of natural laws and and those those natural laws were investigated and looked at it it wasn't like anything could go in the heavens it was just that they had their own special set of natural laws they were fundamentally different and I actually think it's a more impressive integration to uh, take these two different realms that that had the their own special sets of natural that had their own sets of natural laws and realized hey actually if we apply just one set of natural laws consistently um it works for both the terrestrial world and the the celestial uh, observations we've been making as well so with this one uh i had a few questions and i'm going to touch on uh another one of the integrations that professor elias does um, but I think one of the things I've been noticing here is that uh, at, there are times when this, this discussion seems to be a bit conflicted, and it, it delves into polemics. Um, and in particular, I, the, where I noticed it, uh, there were times when Professor Elias wants to, uh, he wants to, he seems to have a bit of an axe to grind with the way physics is taught. Um, and the, the quote that I picked up on is that, uh, uh, it, the, the thing I included here is no relation to the physical world, but I believe the, the specific quote is something like, uh, physics is taught in a way where the symbols have no relation to the physical world. Um, that's, that, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things on that. That is a, I, I find that to be a fairly uncharitable view about the way physics is taught. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that's true. I, I definitely don't think that's universal. Um, I would be open to changing my mind on that, but it's, it's really not the purpose of this course. And I think when you include it, it, uh, it, the, the, the quality of the course suffers for it. 
Um, now, uh, what what I, I will say about this is by, in, by throwing things like this in here, I do think it's in conflict with the stated message of the course, which is to um, to not give these statements on the say so. So if you want to prove something like that, that's that's quite a proof, I think. I think it's it's quite difficult to to prove that and to make you know an incontestable case that this is the this is the way physics is taught as a universal. I think that'd be very very difficult to do. Um, and I don't really think it's the point here. So uh, my my advice in this case would be um, cast this sort of thing as advice. Um, rather than saying physics does it this way, physics teachers do it this way, um, with the implication being that I do it better because I don't, um, give give the advice that, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you're, if, it is easy, you know, because the stuff is hard, it is easy to start thinking about the symbols as not really relating to physical quantities, just, just viewing them as relating to other symbols. Um, I, I tend to find that to be a much more common mistake among physics students rather than, than physics teachers. Um, and so casting is, casting it as advice, I think is a much more effective way to integrate the trap, the message you're trying to communicate that these things really you that uh, that these symbols represent physical quantities and um, and it's important to be thinking about not only what is the physical quantity but what do the relationships mean why why might we, we be manipulating those relationships in certain ways that kind of thing so um, I, I found the similar sort of thing in the later integration where Professor Elias calls it a travesty to call the the k value in Hooke's law, the spring constant. Um, I have actually seen it called the stiffness constant as well, so uh, I've, I've seen it called multiple different things. Um, I, that again, it it feels like it, that that feels like a very strong statement that you want to make because because um, it feels like it's important to really drive home the sort of uh, sort of the the extent of the disagreement that uh, Professor Elias has with the way physics is currently taught. Um, it's fine to have that kind of disagreement. Um, calling it a travesty, again, if you're going to do that, I think that there's more proof that needs to be involved. Um, the calling something you know by a by a by a, a a name that's less than descriptive and more you know has an association it is associated with springs it can be inconvenient but to call it a travesty I, that's got to be proven and I don't think it is here uh, so so again I I would my my advice in both of these areas what I think connects them together is I think there's I think that. Um, that Professor Elias has a real problem with the way he sees physics as currently being taught, and he wants to make that clear. Um, my advice is uh, do that in a different spot. Um, it's when you do that, it tends to it tends to one throw off the the story you're trying to tell, the 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 thing you're trying to communicate, and two it it uh, it it gives the impression that uh, that you've got the the answers um, when these uh, when these these other corrupt physics teachers don't and uh, and 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 and, and uh, I I I I would just say that uh, that it hurts your your presentation. Okay, uh, integration thirty. The heavenly force is gravity. All right, so this one starts with the idea, um, just the standard story, that Newton was struck on the head by an apple while observing the moon and then asks himself the question, are both of these following the inverse square law of gravity? Um, is the force described by the inverse square law, uh, sorry, are both the moon and the apple following the inverse square law? And the converse to that would be, is the inverse uh, is the force described by the inverse square law the gravitational force? So uh, the investigation involves several different steps. 
you find the acceleration of the moon uh, basically by knowing the distance, calculating the velocity, and using the centripetal acceleration formula. Um, you find the, the, uh, the Kepler's constant of the moon for that acceleration. And, and then you, you calculate the, uh, what the acceleration given Kepler's constant, uh, for the, for the Earth to the moon, what that should be at the surface of the Earth, and you compare it to the measured value of acceleration. And it finds out, or it, uh, it comes out that indeed, if this is what you do, that the, the acceleration you calculate at the Earth is exactly what you measure uh, the acceleration to be at the surface of the Earth. So um, <coughs> I really like the discussion of of uh, of the necessity of using center to center measurements for this to work. Now <coughs> um, I did have a question. Um, the there is a line at this point where it says. Uh, Newton is sort of always validating this assumption by by having it correctly predict the outcomes. I would have a question, is that not the hypothetical deductive method? Um, is, isn't that just what he's doing there? And if so, is that an actual validation according to the principles laid down by this course? Uh, some other questions I had. Um, the, this, this somewhat relates to the, the previous integration. But I'm, I'm frequently thrown by the, uh, digressions into, uh, in this case it was Harriman and the history of science, but also the digressions into John McCaskey and the history of science. Um, I think the main problem here is that the role of history, uh, is not necessarily clearly established at the beginning. So it, it when when liberties are taken with the historical narrative you know for brevity's sake oftentimes um the it it kind of feels like there's a need to go back in and justify it um so i i do really think that uh that the again the the digressions into the history and the accuracy of the historical narrative i do think they throw the they throw the focus of the lecture, and it's it's sort of uh, it's sort of jarring to get that, and then to go back into discussing physics. So um, that's that's uh, it's a question and a piece of advice. So uh, I I don't know you know take it take it however you would, but uh, but there's that. Um, integration thirty one was on universal gravitation. My main summary. Um, uh, we, we see that all these heavenly bodies, uh, uh, they, they have orbits or they are part of orbits. So the argument would be that all heavenly bodies exert gravity. And then this is broken into two questions and investigations. The first one is, can gravity explain the tides? The investigation is that the, I wrote the tides correlate with the sun and the moon. I believe this investigation only talks about the correlation with the moon. And ultimately, um, this, the, the tides are explained by differential gravitational forces on the, on the oceans, uh, relative to the location of the moon. Now, I am going to come back to that, but first, let's look at the other question and investigation. Um, this one I think was more important. Does a sphere, uh, behave as if its mass is concentrated as the center? And ultimately through the investigation is that, uh, if we, if we start by looking at rings of mass, then, uh, plates of mass, you know, disks of mass, and then combining all these disks into a sphere, we can ultimately, uh, conclude that yes, indeed, um, you know, using calculus that, uh, that, that a, a, an entire body does act as if its mass is all concentrated at the center. It's an interesting little phenomenon. Um, now, the, the conclusion we draw from this is ultimately that gravity is universal. One, gravity, uh, can explain the tides. And two, um, it, uh, it, it does, when we, when we actually break down and we look at all these little pieces of mass generating their own gravitational force, um, 
in tandem, they 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 ultimately behave as if all the mass is concentrated at the single point in the center of a sphere. And that's kind of where the gravitational force seems to originate from. Um, so the uh, <laughs> I remember I, I included this just for a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a laugh. I remember when I was first taught about this law in my high school physics class. Um, and when that question comes, why aren't people attracted to one another? My high school physics teacher, he started, uh, he went off on the song, If You Like Big Butts and You Cannot Lie. And he would talk about how it's due to the law of universal gravitation. So every time I think about that, when people, I, I like thinking about that song. It's not really a, a point of contention. I just thought it was funny. Um, so some questions I have about this. The main one I have is um, the conventional description of of differential forces causing the tides. Um, now, it's usually presented as if there, uh, and then Professor Elias presents it this way, as if there's a differential pull on the tides, as if, you know, given the, the strength of the gravitational force on uh, directly underneath the moon, it's, uh, it's stronger than it is on the center of the Earth, and stronger still than it is on the op on the oceans on the opposite sides of the world, and ultimately that's why we get these two bulges of uh, of water um, directly under the moon and on the other side of the moon. Now, I I believe I have presented it that way as well, and uh, and 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 I did that until I watched a video that conclude that made me believe that I was probably incorrect and mistaken about this. Um, the way I understand it, and and the more I thought about it, the more it kind of makes sense because I think if that was correct, I think if that view was correct, we would also observe tides and things like sand, um, but we don't. And uh, and ultimately, uh, I've linked to the video here. It's definitely worth a, a watch. But ultimately, I think the reason is it's not that um, that the gravitational force is stronger on one side of the Earth than, than on the other. I believe it is, but I, I think it's negligibly so. It's certainly not enough to cause the tides. Um, like I think that would be that would be very clearly measurable in in terms of a, a differential or a different acceleration due to gravity, uh, different measured acceleration due to gravity, and I don't think that's observed. Um, I, the, the way I saw it described in this video is basically it's, it's not that the, the gravity is stronger directly underneath the moon, it's that on the edges of the Earth, so if you draw, um, draw like a diagonal from the moon to the what would be the pole if the moon's sitting over the equator? If you draw, if you draw diagonal, um, diagonal lines to the pole, it's actually that differential force. And the fact that gravity is slightly weaker at those poles, basically, it creates a pressure gradient in the oceans that has the net effect of pushing the uh, pushing the tides to the edges, which basically amounts to being directly under and um, uh, directly under the moon and then on the opposite side of the moon. So that video is definitely worth looking at just to see if, uh, if, if, if it's worth changing that explanation or worth, uh, worth refining it a bit. Or possibly, um, the way, the way I went to the, 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 the method I chose to take is ultimately that is just to argue that, well, it's a, it's, it's a phenomenon that ultimately originates from differential gravity pulls at different points on the uh, on the earth so uh, and 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 you can also bring the sun into that as well all right so integration 32 was the measurement of force okay so the idea here is that uh, if we wanted to get a mathematical relationship between force and acceleration we need a unit to measure force. Um, uh, I said for mass, it should actually be for force there. Um, make my mistake. Um, so what's something that, that has a unit of force that we can use as basically a unit of measure? Um, difficult to use balance scales because uh, for things other than gravity. And ultimately, it's because this is always a downward push. 
So the conclusion that uh, Robert Hooke comes to is to use the extension of the spring. Uh, and basically, within certain certain realms, the extension of the spring is linear with certain applied masses. Turns out this is true not just for springs, but for a lot of materials they have. They all have a sort of linear uh, relationship with uh, in between uh, force applied and either compression or or extension within a certain and, and eventually that breaks down. But uh, but that's the case. And the conclusion we draw is Hooke's law: the force is equal to the stiffness constant times the displacement of the spring. Um, some memorable aspects by this one. I I found the the discussion about the need for measurement and how how new units of measurement are devised to be interesting. I don't know how much it's needed here, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But I did find I did find that to be uh, to be a somewhat interesting thing to do. Um, I would just I, again I would I, I don't know if it's needed in this particular case, um, and then uh, the the I also thought that the the discussion of of measuring an accurate acceleration given a variable force and that would be the force applied by a spring constant because as the spring becomes less and less deformed the the force is constantly decreasing that is that is something that. Uh, that that does come up and i've i've i have had a bit of difficulty explaining that so the noting that as a uh as a problem definitely worth worth uh observing there um so uh no the the <clears throat> even though i did find it interesting um i like i say i question whether or not that that diversion into the definition of measurement is needed at this particular point. Um, this in integration, it feels like a bit of a, it feels a little bit unconnected from the rest of it. Um, because it's, it's, yeah, I, it's used to measure force, but I don't think, you know, that a spring scale became the the universal unit of force, like I, or or a universal unit to apply a constant force. Um, I I don't think that was the case. So um, I the 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 question then I I, I I don't know that like I've tried to do this use like a spring scale to apply a constant force. That's hard. Like it's 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 very hard to you know, get the acceleration just right to make sure that you're applying a constant force with a spring scale. Um, it'd be much easier to do with something like uh, uh, an Atwood's machine or a modified Atwood's machine. Um, I think that that is, that is, in my mind, that was always the gold standard for um, identifying and, and investigating the relationships between acceleration force and mass was either a modified Atwood's machine or an Atwood's machine. Um, now you got to be careful, particularly in changing the force, that you're not also changing mass. But um, but I I would imagine, and my my initial thought is that investigation gets what you're after much more clearly. Um, so uh, moving on to integration 32, um, so or 33, sorry. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the force affects acceleration. So then we want to investigate the quantitative relationship between forces and accelerations. Um, the investigation is basically to launch a spring cart uh, off a, you know, off a ledge, measure the distance it travels, use the distance it travels to infer the velocity after the launch, and then use the velocity after the launch to infer the acceleration from the constant force. Ultimately, the conclusion we get to is that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so I liked the I liked the circling back to previous experiments and sort of adding on to them to uh, to come to 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 more conclusions. Like I think that's actually a very interesting thing to do. Um, it's it, it really does build on the, um, the the spiral phenomenon 
and uh, and and ultimately, just from a teaching standpoint, if you're going to have the students go do these experiments, it's it's also a way to uh, to have them refine their ability to do the experiment effectively if you're constantly going back to the same setup. So um, it's a very interesting thing to try. Um, I also found this idea about inertia being a type of force and having that be an early misconception that Newton had around it to be an interesting phenomenon as well. So um, that, I, I don't know that I'd ever heard that discussion of, of viewing inertia as a type of force. So it was an interesting sort of thing to think about. Um, now, I also think it's really important to bring up at this point, and, and so I was glad Professor Elias did, that F met is really an essential part of this statement. Um, that it's not a, um, it's not just kind of something we throw on there that, that, and it's, it's, I, it's one of the things I am, I have never been a fan of that, uh, that F equals MA just proliferates all over physics. Um, because in general, that's not true. It's not true that you have any force that's equal to some mass times acceleration. Um, you, you, it's, it's really important that it's, it's all the forces that, uh, that results in, in an acceleration and those have to be taken into consideration. So if anything, I would suggest to harp on that a little bit more. Um, and, and sort of, I don't know, contrast the, the confusions that come up if the, if the formula F equals MA is blindly applied. Um, so some questions I had about this. Um, the, the particular setup, I would just be curious, uh, how well it would work. Um, if you're gonna launch a cart as a projectile, and maybe it's, it's minimally or, or not at all, but, but you're, you're not just accelerating the object, you're also generating an angular acceleration in the wheels. So how does that affect your ability to, uh, to get accurate and reproducible results, uh, given this measurement? Or given this, uh, given this particular experiment. So wouldn't it be, I'm, I'm curious why the cart and not just a projectile, I mean, not, not just a, a launched projectile. Or like I was saying before, um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, can, couldn't you do this more effectively using an Atwoods machine? Couldn't you, uh, couldn't you keep, or a modified Atwoods machine, I think would probably be even better than that. Couldn't you keep force the same by basically keeping the hanging mass constant and then changing the mass on the cart? Um, couldn't you keep mass the same by keeping the distribution of the, to or the, the total mass of the system the same and moving masses from the cart to the hanging mass? Um, I, would, I would just think that a, a modified AdWords would give you significantly cleaner data um, for, for all the reasons I indicated. Um, below there. So the last integration we looked at was the equation of gravitation and this one looked a little something like this. First of all, uh, gravity is uh, exerts a force, causes an acceleration. How do we how do we integrate these ideas more fully? Basically, um, how what what is the acceleration caused by gravitation? So the I, what's the relationship between acceleration and mass, so on and so forth. Um, the investigation is that um, basically it's the 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 looking at the various different um, systems and realizing that for more mass we get more uh, force of gravity and with more mass it's misspelled more unfortunately there we have uh, less acceleration. Um, uh, then the conclusion we get to was the um, the the idea that this this uh, this this thing we had before that that described the uh, the I think I miswrote that actually that uh, this I think this should be g capital G capital M over R squared equals four pi squared over k. So basically, what the this investigation was designed to show. Was that um, that that uh, Kepler's constant, that k value, was actually dependent on the mass of the object? Now, I had a little trouble following this investigation, so 
for instance, I mean, um, uh, let's talk about the the uh, the important aspects. Um, I've had a uh, I've had the 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 importance, particularly when dealing with uh, gravity, of distinguishing between force and acceleration, and how while related they are different quantities, and it's it's a little difficult to get across to people sometimes because of the the reasons Professor Ellie has pointed out that. Um, everything, you know, everything accelerates with the same acceleration due to gravity, and that that is that is often mistakenly that people mistakenly believe that that means everything is the same force of gravity on it, um, and that that's definitely a confusion that needs to be cleared up. Um, like I say, I think that was the ultimate goal, but I found the the integration a little bit confusing towards that end. So some questions I have. Um, we kind of already knew that acceleration didn't depend on mass. It seems like a good chunk of this integration uh, revolves around proving that, but we already knew that was the case. I mean, that was that was something we we observationally uh, we we could we could just see observationally. I guess I would be more interested in this idea or or I think I think the more essential thing to get across is that for a more massive object, um, it it requires a a larger force in order to to attain the acceleration, and the implicate the same acceleration I should say. The implication of that means that the force of gravity has got to be greater for more massive objects. The other question, I I have no idea where the i where that where where the dependence on mass of Kepler's constant came from. That felt like it came out of nowhere for me. I watched it a couple of times. I was not at all clear on why it was the case <clears throat> that Kepler's constant, at least as written, would be uh, would be dependent on mass, nor why it would have the the particular mass that it has, with the particular dependence that it has in this uh, in this equation. So I would like more, um, I, I, I think that needs to be clarified a bit because it wasn't clear to me why that was the case in this, in this integration. So that is it. That is all I have for this one. Thank you for uh, listening to me ramble, and I'll catch you next time.